Okay, good. So this um, um, this appeared recently, very recently, OSTI um, 2021, right? So very recent. Yeah, 2020. 2020. Oh, 2020, okay, so November, so okay. Um, still um, how many months, five months or so, v very recent. Uh, this is about uh, clock synchronization in the data center. Um, I like clock synchronization. It's a very important thing. The state of the clock synchronization for um, internet and data centers has been really a shame, really a shame for our community. And finally, things are getting better. And um, uh, this is uh, mostly engineering effort. It's a relatively straightforward paper to talk about. And when I read the paper, um, basically my first thought was, oh, we did this. We did this on wireless sensor networks 20 years ago. So I was in 2001, I was a, a, a PhD student at the Ohio State University. We had gotten uh, funding from DARPA alongside with several universities in US. Uh, Berkeley was spearheading the uh, effort. Uh, they had this uh, tiny uh, sensors that has um, radios that can wirelessly broadcast to any sensor within, um, within 10 yards. Uh, uh, and uh, these uh, talk to each other, form a ad hoc network. And then these try to monitor um, if there is an intruder through the field of sensors and classify this intruder as a soldier, as a jeep, as a, um, I don't know, tank uh, based on detection. So, um, yeah, so at that point we did it because uh, um, um, this uh, time synchronization was crucial for many things. Uh, for this monitoring because we were taking snapshots and uh, looking at, oh, at this time, this is at the same time, simultaneous detections, how many sensors detected this? If it is uh, like this, then it's a soldier. If it is like this, then it's a, a car. If it is like this, it's a tank. We need to learn about the order of events. So actually I wanted to start with that actually. For any distributed system, time stamping and ordering is a very important thing. Why? Because it's a distributed systems. Processes uh, can only um, learn about each other's states by sending and receiving messages from each other. And they, they, they have very limited information about each other. This information only comes from the messages they receive and these messages come from the past state of that um, nodes, corresponding nodes. And the process needs to compose a coherent view of the system from these messages. And the system is moving along while uh, doing so, okay? So this is like a, a, trying to gather a panorama of a um, street parade only from the um, cell phone, uh, smartphone, um, and partial snapshots from uh, audiences in the street uh, parade and trying to stitch them together to get coherent view of a uh, moving system. This would be impossible if we didn't have good time stamping and a way to order these events with respect to each other to compose coherent snapshots. So this is a fundamental problem in any distributed uh, system and it was in um, for the wireless sensor networks. Before going to wireless sensor networks, let me tell you um, uh, the biggest problem about this synchronization is the um, length of the epsilons, the clock uncertainty. The paper that we are going to discuss today is entirely about making this epsilon as small as possible, even in the worst case. Why? If we have a large epsilon, we may order the events incorrectly. We may order the events incorrectly. So this event and this event has the same clock timestamp, but they are farther apart because of the uncertainty. So 
even though they should give a snapshot, they should give us a snapshot. This is an inconsistent snapshot due to epsilon, because this one happens, then something else happens, then that is that affects this one, and this is a corrupted snapshot. This is not a coherent snapshot anymore. To give an example, if these were reading the state of the same variable uh, from these things, but after this, there is a write to the variable. This comes, uh, this write is uh, observed here. Now, even though they should have the same reading, they have different readings because of this, because of the epsilon. How would you solve this? Like Spanner has basically similar problem. The way Spanner solves is, yeah, you would have some epsilon. When the original paper came uh, in sp uh, from Spanner, I think it was around 2010, 2011, even with atomic clocks, Spanner was able to give uh, six millisecond epsilon. That's huge, that's huge, right? So that's why I say uh, the state of the clock synchronization in data centers has been a mess until recently. Um, and I'm going to talk about why that's the case. Because in 2001, we were able to get five microsecond clock synchronization in wireless sensor networks. And these wireless sensor, these nodes have a eight kilobyte RAM and four megahertz uh, CPU. These are practically, <laughs> these are practically powerless uh, things, but they had the uh, microsecond accuracy um, uh, clock synchronization compared to spanner with atomic clocks, in, uh, six millisecond uh, bound. Okay. So how would Spanner deal with this problem? Basically, Spanner would uh, make this node uh, wait for the duration of epsilon before allowing an event. Then this A would be even pushed further and it would not uh, be able to, um, the effect of A would not be able to uh, observe uh, at B. Does this make sense? So we would uh, put, um, um, wait for the uncertainty window before generating a new event block thing so that this uh, um, snapshot violation would not happen. That's the fundamental problem that we are trying to uh, prevent. And what does this tell us? Well, you need to get your epsilons as small as possible, right? And the paper now shows uh, nanosecond level epsilon. So that's what we are going to discuss. Okay, inconsistent snapshots are dangerous. This is like a um, panorama uh, gone wrong, smartphone panorama gone wrong. Um, it's like crossing of beams in Ghostbusters. Okay, so it's dangerous. Uh, this is an example. I don't want to go uh, more uh, into explanation. Let me now skip to um, wireless sensor network um, part a small lecture in time synchronization in wireless sensor networks that I have been teaching in my classes uh, in 2005. Okay, share screen again. Okay. Alexi, is this good? You see time synchronization? Okay, good. Yeah, for wireless sensor network, time synchronization is even more important because this is cyber physical system. We like to observe a phenomena and take a snapshot like the uh, detection um, example I gave. And um, later this was also used for localization of the nodes. The nodes localize uh, themselves with respect to other nodes and reference points with GPS by way of uh, first getting time synchronization, then using the time synchronization to triangulate themselves through others. Uh, an example of the first one was, um, you know, snapshotting things was Vanderbilt University did a demo of sniper localization with sensor networks. So they actually use real rifles to <laughs> shot at a target and the uh, sensor nodes had so good synchronization, you know, microsecond level synchronization, that when they heard the, um, um, what is it, the bullet muzzle, right, shockwave, 
they took timestamp and sent it to the base station. And from the base station, they could uh, realize that, okay, the shot was coming like this and they could uh, pinpoint a sniper. Um, so an example of what could be done with uh, wireless sensor networks with um, uh, very, very, um, you know, eight kilobyte RAM and four megahertz uh, uh, CPU. And yet with uh, good clock synchronization, this was possible. Okay. Um, these things had um, um, uh, clocks. And what is clock? Clock is an oscillator, right? So uh, I'm old enough that I was using a mechanical clock first, but then like when I was 10, there was, um, you know, uh, this, um, what is it called? Digital clocks, etc. But then there was also this, uh, uh, again, analog clocks, but with, um, um, what is it called? Quartz, they call it quartz movement. Why? Because uh, it's the same clock that your uh, computer uses and your sensor uses. This is quartz, um, uh, quartz crystal, um, uh, oscillations. It counts the number of times this uh, oscillates. There is an error bound in one second. It oscillates, uh, let's say, 10,000 times. So if you count uh, with a, a counter circuit that 10,000 oscillations, okay, this is a second or millisecond, whatever, right? Well, this, this, but this is not precise. This is not precise. Atomic clocks use rubidium. Rubidium loses one microsecond a day. It's so precise. The, uh, the quartz crystals use, uh, I think, many milliseconds a day. Initially, in the first times, even my uh, things would require occasional resetting, etc. And the, another problem with the quartz uh, uh, crystal, uh, getting your local clock from cross, uh, uh, quartz crystal, is it's very temperature um, sensitive. So, uh, yeah, so here's the thing. Your computer, your laptop, um, a server in a um, data center, unless it's using, yeah, its local clock is also um, quartz uh, oscillation. And the wireless sensor networks were also using this quartz oscillation. They are dirt cheap the quartz uh, oscillator, so local clock. But they, as I told you, not very dependable and they change a lot with um, temperature. Actually, when the temperature gets colder, they oscillate more. When it gets uh, hotter, they oscillate less. And in data center, with respect to cooling, this could be like um, 100, uh, uh, 100 Fahrenheit. Yeah, yeah, more than 100 Fahrenheit even sometimes. And with uh, maybe sometimes with burst cooling, it can get down to 60 or 80 Fahrenheit. And uh, you could see uh, bursty um, variations in the oscillation rate. So this includes um, 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 error. Another thing, not any two quartz crystal is the same they have different oscillation frequency. They are not uh, quality material, they are dirt cheap. So that's why we needed clock synchronization. We synchronized to the clock of one of the nodes. So we use that as the reference clock. Otherwise each uh, node would drift uh, um, from each other, okay? And when you are trying to synchronize two nodes over um, radio or over messaging, um, there are many um, um, places where um, latencies will be incurred, like, uh, oh, packing up the message, sending the message, right? The actual message um, transmission bit by bit is light speed. Radio speed is light speed. That's this small propagation thing. But um, Radio itself, putting it on radio, these are uh, four megahertz CPU and the radio is also slow. You are putting the bits on the uh, channel on the air slowly, okay? So that takes time. So there is a huge uh, delay from this sending speed, okay? Sending and access to the radio uh, 
packing up the package, uh, access to the radio, radio safe, uh, sense byte by byte, and then a very small travel time with light speed to the other antenna, but the other antenna again would have reception from the radio byte by byte and then uh, packing receive. So there are delays introduced, but you know, deterministic delays are easy to deal with. We can get rid of them. The problem is non-deterministic uh, delays because deterministic delays like time of flight, we can calculate it and get rid of it. GPS is have your, your smartphone has very good synchronization compared to your laptop. Why? This gets the time through a satellite miles away. But that's one hop synchronization. The propagation time is light speed and we know the location of the um, uh, satellite. Satellite sends its location with the signal as well. And we can calculate the um, flight time and flight time is deterministic. So we can uh, factor it. And so we have very uh, microsecond level synchronization on the phone, even though it gets its time from the satellite. Uh, uh, miles away. The important thing is deterministic versus non-deterministic uh, errors. Um, non-deterministic uh, in the wireless sensor network would come from this radio weight, etc. But we would use MacLayer timestamping, and that's also another uh, idea in the paper. They say that hardware timestamping. Don't do the timestamping before uh, uh, putting the message. Put the timestamping while it's going to the um, uh, channel, okay? Make layer timestamping, that's a big uh, thing. So we get rid of this and very little remains for um, um, the non-deterministic. These are deterministic parts and they are easy to account for. Transmission time, we can account for byte level and uh, get rid of it. So we could get, um, 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 very small epsilon. Okay. Um, okay. In the interest of time, maybe I'll go uh, quickly through this. But all I wanted to tell you here was that uh, non-determinism is bad and non-determinism comes from um, um, in wireless sensor networks, uh, uh, packing, etc. So we got rid of it with Mac layer. Why did we have crappy timestamps, uh, uh, time synchronization in laptops, in data centers until recently? Where do the um, non-determinism come from there? Alexi, you would know. Network. Network, exactly. The packages uh, can get uh, uh, arbitrarily late. That's the thing that we need to figure out. And they actually, um, and the, uh, you would need, again, in order for the clocks not to drift too far, you would need much frequent uh, uh, synchronization messages. You would need, uh, they are using NIC level timestamping and NIC level point to point. There is no other uh, switch between or switch to switch. Uh, there is no other hop between uh, synchronization. So they get rid of that non-deterministic uh, switch or router induced delay, then it becomes simpler. There is one more thing remaining. In the paper, they use a um, um, spanning tree to synchronize to one node. They don't talk about it too much, but why do you synchronize to one node? Wouldn't it make sense to maybe uh, take average of more nodes and synchronize? So there is a saying, a person with uh, one watch always knows the time. A person with two watches is never sure. So when the point is to get the epsilon small, it is better to lock onto one node and uh, make every node, in order not to create confusion, make every node walk with the pace of that node. So you can have very small epsilon. If you try to average, you have more accurate time, but the epsilon would be bigger. So that's the thing. That's why they use a spanner a spanning tree. And we also use the spanning tree as part of our, uh, Ohio State's uh, uh, clock synchronization protocol. Wonder with clock synchronization protocol called flooding time synchronization protocol that they demoed uh, 
in a very cool way with the sniper localization scenario also uses the spanning tree, okay? Um, yeah, in our case, actually we also had the backup root thing because we use the grid topology. You normally uh, take your parent and the um, uh, root node is on the left uh, bottom corner. So any node has a way to the um, root node, either going to the left or bottom, right? If you go to left or bottom, you always have a uh, way to go to here, okay? Um, and uh, with a local decision, if this way is not good, you can switch to the other way. So backup root, uh, if you have a grid topology, regular grid topology, backup root, uh, backup uh, route um, calculation is not hard. That's all I'm saying. And we explored all these um, from 2001 to 2004 um, in wireless sensor networks. And when I'm reading this paper, basically I got reminded of this. So now I can use the paper slides to talk about the paper. Uh, a bit. Oh, actually, I was going to show one more slide before that, right? So, okay. Okay, so this is um, the um, uh, paper, Sundial, okay? And it compares with uh, other previous work and uh, in different dimensions, message type. Of course, L3 is too much. Like if you are doing above the transport level, you are introducing non-determinism, okay? So this is doing at L2 level, uh, data link level. It would be even better to do it at the physical level um, but uh, they did not have that much control, okay? Um, dealing with delay noises. If you do it multi-hop, good luck. Your epsilon will be huge due to switches and routers involved. So they are doing point to point, neighbor to neighbor, okay? Synchronization structure. You need to do it with respect to a master. Guy with one clock always knows the time, okay? Um, and uh, most of the others are like this. I don't know why DTP is doing the other way. Um, support time uncertainty bound, it has this. So I just wanted to show this to put it in context with other work. Huygens, Emin Wahdet was also an author on the Huygens work before. It, um, it is an interesting idea. It's, I think, uh, about filtering about, uh, it can do multi-hop, but it uses some uh, it spaces the messages with respect to each other. And if these, two, and this spacing is very perfect. And when they are going through a router, if uh, they got into contention, the spacing changes. And the receiver side looks at the two packages, their spacing. If it changed, this, this, this should not be used for synchronization. This is tainted. So it uses sort of machine learning to filter about the bad ones and only synchronize from the good packets to uh, um, synchronize. If I'm not remembering uh, wrong, that's the idea in the Huygens thing. Uh, I think in Sundial, um, they had, uh, they are using hardware. They are using this NIC level timestamping and NIC level synchronization. And they are able to get nanosecond uh, level epsilon which is uh, much more uh, precise, much more small than any other previous work. PTP is of course the, um, um, the um, what, what is it called? Um, successor to NTP. NTP was, guess when, guess when NTP was um, um, started to use? 1981, it's so recent, it's so recent. I mean, the state of uh, synchronization is what has been a mess. In, the NTP started in 1981. Um, 
And NTP, what was the epsilon you can get uh, with NTP in wireless sensor networks? We were able to get microsecond. What's the epsilon you get with NTP? If you don't do anything, could be 50 millisecond. So it's 10,000 times more. It's 10, you can't put a good bound on it. It's 10,000 times more than what you get with uh, the uh, WIMP wireless sensor nodes, which is five microsecond. And now Sundial says that, oh, I have um, uh, nanosecond level, 100 nanosecond level epsilon. And why? Because the data center networks are at your control, heterogeneous. You use hardware level synchronization to send a very uh, uh, frequent um, synchronization messages. Uh, and uh, the networks are uniform and you can use better clocks. Okay, about clocks. Atomic clocks are still expensive. They use it in satellites, but atomic clocks use one microsecond in a day uh, from the ideal clock. Uh, you know, at the satellites due to um, relativity, they, they are affected, but that's a deterministic uh, effect. And they can also put that into equation and that doesn't change your clock synchronization epsilon. Okay, extra information. Okay, uh, atomic clocks are still expensive, uh, but uh, recently, like um, um, maybe up to 10 years ago, uh, they come up with ovenized clocks. It's not uh, the uh, atomic clock uh, oscillator, which is rubidium, very precise. It's something else, but with uh, ovenized, uh, they are able to have a closed loop to, if it is uh, maybe, um, they have a feedback. Uh, if it is starting to oscillate more, it makes it a little cooler. So it doesn't refrain from its normal rate. So this loses 25 microsecond um, um, day. And this is pretty good, close to atomic clock, right? But it also has a general, these are, um, tied to a um, GPS antenna uh, in the data center. So they could get the time also from GPS, right? But let's say it's cloudy. You don't see the uh, um, satellite. Uh, it was really bad. You don't see the satellite for an hour. You didn't lose much. So this is the idea. They use uh, this. I think they use these kind of organized clocks in the data center. Why do I know so much about uh, time synchronization? I don't know. <laughs> okay. I guess it just started uh, with the wireless sensor network work. And I, and I was like, come on, NTP, this doesn't make sense. Like 50 millisecond, this doesn't make sense. Okay. So let me just give a quick summary of the paper. Um, using their slides. Okay, so um, good, Alexi, Sundial. Am I in the right screen? Okay. Um, this is from mostly Google, but with Harvard University. And I think I heard the company somewhere in between one of the affiliations. Okay, so. Um, wouldn't it be nice if we have synchronized clocks with tight bounds? This is basically the figure I showed you. Uh, so if this is reading at T because of the epsilon, this T might be even come before T minus one. So in order for the T to come at its regular time, you basically make it red. So it's a, it's the same uh, version of uh, my, um, problem that I showed uh, in the initial slides. Um, so it would be easy to give um, good clock synchronization if it were not for false. The, uh, the most of the challenges, most of the discussion in the paper come, okay, when we have link failures, when we have node failures, how can we still give the worst case uh, uh, bound epsilon to be small? Of course, 
it's not tolerant to too many things. It may tolerate the domain failure, meaning that four nodes at once gone, but it will not tolerate arbitrary failure, meaning that um, uh, kill most of the uh, links most of the time or kill most of the things some of the time, etc. Okay. Uh, okay. So how do you synchronize? You synchronize by message passing. If you don't know, you take uh, the round trip divided by two, but if there are other nodes in between, this won't be a good um, um, way to do it. So the way you do it is the best way to do it is between neighboring devices. So that's what they use. And for synchronization, the best way to do it is not to take average of everybody's clocks, um, it works much better if you just use one route and everybody goes with uh, synchronize its uh, clock there with respect to that thing because it's a reference point. It may not be the ideal time, but it is damn near to it because it uses uh, this overnight clocks with GPS and who cares as long as we can keep our epsilon small, we, we are not into non-second level precision determining of events anyways. The important thing is to keep the epsilon small. So a man with one clock knows the time, okay? Um, and periodic synchronization. If you do this uh, um, uh, not frequently, the clock drifts will still uh, add up because the nodes are using shitty clocks. Quartz oscillation is shitty and with the temperature changes, it gets shittier. So you just need, uh, I think one day we may get uh, overnight clocks in the nodes, but till that day comes, and since it didn't come, uh, they have to do this with uh, frequent uh, periodic synchrony. It's so frequent that every 500 microseconds, they need to send synchronization signal. This won't work over software. So they use the NIC cards themselves. They use the synchronization bake. This is, this is why they call it hardware software co-design. They do the synchronization in hardware, okay? Okay, so this is classic mambo jumbo. This is like, you have a drift rate. You have to make the drift rates the same. Your, so your epsilon would be um, the time you last uh, synchronize and uh, within that thing, the max drift rate times uh, uh, um, uh, that time plus, uh, plus a constant, okay? The synchronization is a PI um, proportional plus integral. It just means that you are basically using uh, drawing straight lines to figure out what should be, uh, what is my rate uh, and uh, 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 adjusting your rate by uh, curve fitting or line fitting uh, with respect to the references rate. Okay, so simple stuff. That stuff is simple. But this says that they, they say that we can't do anything about max drift rate. Why? Because the temperature changes uh, abruptly in data center. Sometimes we do like cooling, a lot of cooling, and then the clocks go berserk. So the, the thing that we have control over is T last synchronization. So we will do very fast synchronization. How fast? Five, mi um, five microsecond fast. Ooh. Then you can only do this in the, um, in the hardware level at the Nix. They bake it at the Nix uh, network interface cards. Um, uh, okay, what about failures? Oh, failures would suck. You know, we, if we had to figure out the routes, uh, uh, we first need to detect the failure. Then we need to figure out another route to this thing. That would uh, take a long time. So what's the solution? What if we figured out the backup routes and only you would need to detect the failure, then you would immediately switch to backup route. If everybody does this uh, locally, and this would be local because your uh, backup route is given to you before, we could uh, recover very quickly from a link failure or uh, even a node failure. Node failure, I'll talk 
more. Yeah, if your parent died, basically you will go to backup. That's that could be the same thing as link if it's immediate uh, failure. Uh, parent. Um, what was I going to say? Mm. Oh, how would they? But but for if this didn't get message, if it still kept giving its time, this would not know about the time. It would they would know about the failure even later. So they say that oh, you know, we use synchronized messages. What does synchronized messages mean? I won't send you a message if I don't receive a message. So everybody will time out at the same time. And everybody would uh, be able to detect the, the subtree of this, would be able to detect um, a failure at the same time. And they all with local action switch to the backup uh, routes and uh, the recovery would be fast. Okay. And they call this, oh, this is hardware software um, co design. Software part, pre compute the backup plan. Ah, not a big deal. I mean, uh, a lot of the paper discusses about uh, backup at. Uh, computation, but it's not hard. I mean, it's a guy with um, third um, year computer science curriculum could uh, follow that discussion, not, not, nothing very fancy, right? Um, and the hardware part comes from, oh, we need to do this uh, um, um, synchronization over the, uh, over the network level at the NICS. So, that's where the hardware level comes. Um, okay, yeah. And if you time out, you turn to your backup parent and the others would also time out the same time they turn to your backup uh, parents. And uh, if we have these backup routes calculated so that they are um, um, loop free so that they don't uh, just tolerate one failure but failure of a uh, um, domain so you don't maybe, if you are in the same rack, you don't make your backup, uh, uh, if your parent and backup is in the same rack, that's a bad thing. Maybe that backup failed, right? So that's what they mean by domain. So choose your parent from another rack so that it's not a problem. Um, okay, now the root, right? We all synchronize to the root. What if the root dies? we have a backup route. If the backup route dies, we, we are screwed. <laughs> but, um, okay, when do, but now the, this is consensus problem. What if the backup route thinks the route died, but the route did not die? So backup route needs a witness. It gets it from another subtree of the route, right? So it gets the time from the route, but also from another node from the. If it doesn't get the time from the route, it could be either the root is dead or this link is bad. If this link is bad and this guy says, I'm the root, now we have two clocks and we are increasing epsilon. So it needs to witness. If it doesn't hear from the root, but hears from the witness, the witness sends a message only because it is still getting messages from root, because its parent is getting messages, because its parent is getting messages. This is synchronous messaging idea, right? So then the backup route will not pull the trigger. It will say, I, I cannot reach the route. I will um, basically use my backup route uh, for synchronization from now on, okay? But if the, if I cannot hear from my route and I also did not hear from this other node, witness, then I declare that I am the root now. Then I start giving my messages and everybody synchronizes to me. So it's pretty much that. And uh, you know, this is hundred, this is log scale, hundred times better epsilon. This is a feat of um, engineering. They had the access to this NICS. They did the timestamping uh, and the time synchronization point to point, link to link in the, um, NICs and uh, so they beat uh, the competition like PTP is the standard NTP sucks. Uh, PTP requires special switches or special sort of deployment. Uh, uh, but it, it, it improves a lot over that. Um, this is log scale. So uh, it's 100 times lower than the nearest competition. And uh, so it's here, even when um, 
uh, faults happen, it's not too much affected by any of the uh, failures, okay? And they break down its affectation about or the improvement saying that, okay, that's the next one. Uh, where, does, where does this improvement come? Frequent messages, it improved by maybe order of two. And uh, synchronous messages, it increased a lot, uh, again, a lot when there are no faults, order of three, but when there are faults, uh, without a backup plan, we are too much affected. But if uh, we use local computer uh, or local switch to the backup plan, now we get this 100 level. Um, okay, that's it.